Oh, man, I'm like breathing into the mic. Okay, there we go. We're going to start with clicker questions. Golly, Moses, you're getting the hang of it. All right, here we go. First one. First two are reading checks to see how much uh, you got out of the reading versus out of what I'm going to do today. So first one's on elasticity. Uh, the concept of price elasticity of demand tells us A, B, C, D, or E. A, whether quantity demanded increases or decreases in response to a change in price. B, how much quantity demanded increases or decreases in response to a change in price. C, whether price increases or decreases in response to a change in price. D, how much price increases or decreases in response to a change in demand. And E, I don't know. A, B, C, D, or E. Three more seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And all right. Oop, and then I got to find my pen and choose a color. Choose a color, any color. B. 62%. All right, so let me tell you something. The percent right on these questions tends to be a really good predictor of the mean on the midterm. I just heard a whole bunch of oh shits. <laughs> but it tends to be the case that the percent right on these clicker questions tends to be a pretty close predictor of the mean on the midterm. And your midterm is when? October 1st, which is just in nine days. So, okay, I'll just leave it at that. All right, the next one. How about the next one? Let's try this. How about profit? Which statement is true? Accounting profit is the same as economic profit. Accounting profit is always larger than economic profit. Accounting and economic profit are different, but without more information, we don't know which one is larger. Accounting profit is always smaller than economic profit, and E, I don't know. Hmm. Three seconds. One, two, three. Ooh. You don't want to know what percentage of people got this one right. Ouch. All right, with luck, we'll get to that by the end of today. And hopefully, you'll, we'll change that number and increase it three or fourfold. All right. Um, hmm. I'll come back to that. All right, where are we going to start? We're going to start with where we ended, which is looking at the effect of the tax increase. What we didn't get to look at is the effect on the surplus and the concept of deadweight loss. So for your problem set, you sketched in what happened to the surplus, uh, but I didn't get to talk about the idea of deadweight loss. So we're going to put price on the vertical, quantity on the horizontal. Assume this is a tax that is remitted to the government by the seller. That's true with almost every tax, sales tax or excise tax that you and I pay. The only example I've ever been able to come up with where we're the ones paying the money directly to the government is if you buy a used car from a person, not from a, not from a dealer, but from a person. If you buy a used car from me, then when you go and register that car at the DMV, you have to pay the sales tax. That's the only example I can think of where the buyer remits the tax to the government. So the seller remitting the tax is the norm. Uh, let's see. Let's start out with a demand, downward sloping demand curve, D1, upward sloping supply curve, S1. Find your initial equilibrium, dash it over, call it price P1, dash it down, call it quantity Q1. If we wanted to shade in the original consumer surplus and producer surplus, we could do so. Uh, let's see, I'm going to take a highlighter on this one. Uh, and the original consumer surplus would be the area of this triangle. Let me see if I can get this. To, oh, good. There we go. The area of this triangle above the price and below the demand curve. And the original producer surplus would be the triangle below the price. How's that? Is that good? Uh, below the price and above the demand curve. So where am I going to put my labels so I have space? So that was the original producer surplus, and the yellow here was the original consumer surplus. There you go. All right, so far so good. Got two triangles, shade of demand, original sur consumer surplus, original producer surplus. Here we go. Suppose now there's a tax that's implemented that's remitted to the government uh, by the seller. So we're going to show that as a shift of the supply curve. The supply curve shifts to the left, but the easier way to show it is the supply curve is shifting up by the amount of the tax. So if we use uppercase T to stand for tax, the second supply curve is the first supply curve plus an upward shift that's equal to the size of the tax. And so this distance between your two uh, supply curves is equal to the size of the tax. The new price. It's going to be where the second supply curve intersects the, the original demand curve. Dash that over, call it price P2. That's the amount the consumers will pay to the seller. It will, the price that we pay will go up because the seller is going to pass some of the burden of that tax onto you and I uh, in our role as consumers. From that new equilibrium point, well, first let's dash all the way down and label quantity Q2. And then go straight down from that new equilibrium point or straight up from your quantity Q2, find the spot on your original supply one curve. And that, because those two supply curves are exactly T distance apart, the distance between them is the amount of the tax. If I dash over from that dot that I drew, that amount is the price P2 minus the tax, P2 minus the tax. So from, go up from QT, the first dot you're going to hit is where you hit supply one. That's P2 minus the tax. Keep going up. The second uh, dot is where you hit demand one and supply two. That's P2. If you want to label them, P2 is what we pay, and P2 minus the tax is what the seller retains. What's the new surplus? All right. For the consumers, choose some colors. Uh, I had yellow before. Let me go with sort of an orangey color here. For the consumers, the consumer surplus same definition. It's, how, it's the difference between the amount they're paying and the amount they would have been willing to pay. Nothing's happened to the demand curve, and so the, but the price has gone up. And so for consumers, that new consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve and above that new price P2. So that's our, that looks weird, doesn't it? Our new consumer surplus. For the sellers, let's see if this works. The sellers are, are retaining that price P2 minus the tax. They were, P2 minus the tax is the amount they're retaining. They were willing to sell for, originally before they even thought about the tax, the amounts that are on that supply curve S1. And so you can show that producer surplus as the area of the triangle above the original supply curve and below P2 minus T. It's a very color. It looks like a sale at this point, doesn't it? So that's my new producer surplus. That's the same. Think geometry, side angle side. That's congruent triangle with if you had chosen. Ooh, can I draw this and then erase it? I'm going to hope to erase something after I draw it. If you thought, oh, it should be this triangle below P2 and above the second supply curve, those two triangles are congruent. So the area of the one that I shaded in, P2 minus T down to the original supply curve, or the area of the triangle P2 down to the new supply curve, 90 degree angles, same side, same hypotenuse, uh, congruent triangles. Doesn't matter which one you use. All right, let me see if I can erase that second thing. Yeah. Ah, good, sort of. All right, then one more piece. The government has imposed a tax. And so there's some of this money now is being sent to the government. The government's just our representatives. And so the amount that is the tax, that's that vertical distance. That's the vertical distance between P2 and P2 minus T is the tax. That's the amount of the tax. How much revenue is going? Well, the amount that they sell, which is the quantity Q2, times the tax. And so that lovely looks like a green. Does that look green? Sure. That's the government revenue. How many different things can we draw on one graph? 
That there is the government's tax revenue. All right? We have reshaded everything but one little triangle. There's one little triangle that's near the intersection, the original intersection, that has not been reshaded. I'm going to shade it. Let's see, highlighter. Ooh, do I have like a magenta? Sure, I'll shade it. Red, 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 red. This triangle right there, nobody gets that. Consumer surplus has gone down because the price went up, so there's fewer people who are saying, woo I got a deal, and the people who are saying are getting a smaller deal. The producer surplus has gone down because the price that the seller is retaining is less than the price before, so there's fewer sellers who are going, yeah, I got a killing, um, or made a killing, whatever they do. Uh, and so that producer surplus went down. Some of that difference went off to the government, which is our representatives in the form of tax revenue, but there's this little red triangle left here that goes to nobody. So that triangle, economists call that dead weight loss. Always makes me think of, is it Pirates of the Caribbean where they say dead men tell no tales? Yeah, always makes me think of dead men tell. I can't do that. Dead men tell no tales. You have to imagine the voice. I can't do whoever that guy is that does dead men tell no tales. Dead weight loss. Dead. Is, that, is dead a good thing or a bad thing? Dead's usually a bad thing, right? Uh, and so that using the phrase dead weight loss, wow, there's three words strung together that all have sort of a bad connotation to them. Something's dead, something's weighty, and there's a loss. Those are three words that all say, ooh, bad, 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 bad. It's not a normative concept, even though it has this phrase that sounds very normative to it. It's a positive economic concept. It's the notion of how much total surplus just disappears, is lost when there is, in this case, a government intervention in the form of a tax. So that consume, the surplus that is lost, that's not recovered by consumers, by producers, or by the government, is called the dead weight loss. And in this case, it would be the area of the triangle. So the total surplus falls with a tax. We could also show that the total surplus falls with a subsidy if the government was subsidizing behavior. We just bought a new low-flow toilet. Um, we're going to get $50 back from East Bay Mud for buying that toilet. That's an example of a government subsidy. In that case, we also would have a decrease in the size of the surplus. And in both cases, economists call it a dead weight loss. It makes it sound like dead weight loss sounds like pretty awful, right? Like something you wouldn't want to have. What we'll see in the next part of the course after the midterm is there are times when we do want to have a dead weight loss. So you have to be careful with some of these phrases that economists use because they are sometimes constructed as rhetorical devices to make us think that something is really bad when it just is what it is what it is. So dead weight loss is, is surplus that nobody recaptures when there is a tax. All right, click your question. Ooh, let's turn this off. There you go. The idea of dead weight loss is an example of what sort of analysis? Positive, negative, normative, political, or good Lord, you lost me with all the colors. Or you're still back thinking about the mapping of the percent right to the midterm mean. Three seconds. One, two, and three. 70%. Get the happy face. Dead weight loss is not a normative term. There is no such thing in economics as negative economic analysis. It's not normative economic analysis. It's straight off positive economic analysis, but it's a phrase chosen to have a very particular rhetorical punch. Right? So it's, nor it's not normative. It's positive economic analysis, but yes, it does have a rhetorical punch. All right. The big concept we want to look at today is the concept of elasticity. We're going to define elasticity, and then we're going to use it uh, in a number of different applications. So first, the idea of elasticity. If I had a big rubber band up here, I could show you elasticity in fact, instead I have a picture. Elasticity of one thing with regard to something else. The elasticity of A with respect to B. With elasticity, we're answering the question, how much does A, whatever the A is, change in when B changes? So for instance, if I had a rubber band, I could be showing you how much the, the length of the rubber band changes as the force of my fingers and arms changes. And that would tell you how elastic that rubber band is because I would be pulling on it. If it was a really old rubber band, if it was one that had been in the drawer for, say, 35 or 45 years, how much elasticity would it have? A lot or a little? A little, right. So if you take a rubber band that's been around since well before you were born and you pull on it, what does it do? It breaks. So it doesn't have any elasticity at all. Brand new rubber bands tend to have a lot of elasticity. So how much does something change? How much does the length of the rubber band change in response to the force that I'm using to pull it apart? For economics, we're going to talk about how much does something change when something else changes. And the way we calculate that is by taking the percentage change of A and dividing it by the percentage change of B. So the elasticity of A with regard to B is what's the percent change in A in response to or divided by the percentage change of B. There are a whole lot of different elasticities we could talk about. We're only going to talk about two, but let me show you the definitions of four. On the demand side, elasticity, we can talk about how much the quantity demanded changes due to a change in buyer income. That's called the income elasticity of demand. So if you want to know how much quantity demanded changes in response to a change in consumer or buyer income, we take the percentage change in QD and divide it by the percentage change in income. How much quantity demanded changes in response to a change in price is called the price elasticity of demand. How much quantity demanded changes in response to a change in other prices? It's called the cross price elasticity of demand. So how much does your demand for sweatshirts go up if there's an increase in the price of tuition? Would be an example of that. And then on the supply side, we can look at how much the quantity supplied changes due to a change in price, and that's called the price elasticity of supply. We're going to look at the first one briefly and then spend more time looking at the second. So we're going to look briefly at the concept of income elasticity of demand, and then we'll spend a lot more time talking about the concept of price elasticity of demand. These other two things exist, but for... We just don't have time. You know, it's only 23 classes. There you go. All right, here we go. Income elasticity of demand. Remember the definitions of normal goods. With a normal good, if there's an increase in income, do we buy more of the good or less of the good? More. So with an increase in income, there's an increase in quantity demanded at every price. I'll write that whole thing out. At every price. And with an inferior good, if there's an increase in income, do we buy more of it or less of it? Less. There's a decrease in quantity demanded at every price. So the income elasticity of demand, the first thing it's going to tell us is whether or not demand, whether or not we're looking at a normal good or an inferior good. Because with a normal good, as income goes up, the quantity of demand goes up. So that ratio is going to be positive. With an inferior good, it's going to be negative. The concept of income elasticity, though, is a how much. We're really focused here on how much. By how much does quantity demanded change when the income changes? And the answer to that question is what's the value of the income elasticity of demand? So let's do it for example. Suppose, for example, suppose that I told you that somebody had gone out and done a bunch of measurements and found that when there was a negative 1% change in income, and why is the shorthand that economists use for income? How come? I don't know. It just is. Why is the shorthand we use for income? When there's a negative 1% change in income, when income falls by 1%, the quantity demanded for some good falls by 5%. If we want to calculate the income elasticity of demand, we remember that the elasticity is the percentage change in the quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in income. We're looking at the response of quantity demanded to a change in income. Negative 5 divided by negative 1, or 5. You don't have to convert these to decimals because if you convert the top to decimals, you've got to convert, if you convert the numerator to decimals, you've got to convert the denominator to decimals, and we all hate decimals, so just don't do it. On the other hand, suppose that we had a different example. Suppose that we had a clicker that worked. There we go. Uh, suppose that the, when income 
went up by 2%, quantity demanded went down by 1%. In that case, we would say that elasticity is negative 1, the percentage change in quantity demanded, divided by plus 2, the percentage change in income, which is right there, negative 1 half or negative 0.5. It's that easy. So you're given what the percentage change in income is, you're given the percentage change in quantity demanded, voila, boom, 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 you can calculate the elasticity. We've got some terminology that we use to describe different types or different values of elasticity. The terminology applies to the absolute value. Not, we don't look at the negative or the positive. The terminology applies to the absolute value of elasticity. If demand is perfectly inelastic, then that value of elasticity that we just calculated, which remember was the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in income, that value of elasticity is zero. So if it's perfectly inelastic, it means that no matter what happens to income, quantity demanded doesn't change at all. If demand is relatively inelastic, that value of, of elasticity and absolute value is between zero and one. So it's a fraction less than one. And then we say demand is relatively inelastic. But there's not very much of a change in quantity demanded in response to a change in income. In the middle, we have something we call unit elasticity or unitarily elastic. In that case, the elasticity is exactly equal to one. The percentage change in quantity demanded is exactly equal to the percentage change in income. Above that, we've got relatively elastic. If the elasticity is greater than one, we say demand is relatively elastic. And finally, if elasticity is infinitely large, then we say that it is perfectly elastic. Most everything we're going to see in the real world is going to fall in the second or the fourth categories. That is, it's going to be either relatively inelastic or relatively elastic. It's very uncommon to run across something where the elasticity is exactly equal to one, and it's uncommon to have the perfectly inelastic or the perfectly elastic. So that's our terminology. All right, click your question. Which of these statements about income elasticity is correct? Normal goods always have relatively income inelastic demand. Normal goods have income elasticity less than zero. Inferior goods have income elasticity less than zero. Inferior goods always have relatively income elastic demand. Or, oh my God, when is October 1st? Oh. Hmm. You're thinking. Thinking is good. So what did we know? We knew that with inferior goods, or normal goods, normal goods, we knew that with normal goods, an increase in income causes quantity demanded to go which way? And we knew that with inferior goods, an increase in income causes quantity demanded to go which way? Yeah, okay. Use that. You can always change your answer until I call stop. Why don't you talk to the person next to you and see what they got and see if you agree. And then you can change your answer. If your person next to you convinces you they're right, you can change your answer. Oh, it's helping a little bit. It's helping a little bit. Not a lot, but a little. It's helping a little bit, but we still only have a little more than half that have it right. Talk to the person next to you. Make sure that the two of you have the same answer. Make sure the person next to you and you have the same answer. And if you've got people on either side of you, that means three of you have to have the same answer. And pretty soon that makes a chain. And the whole row is going to have the same answer. And with that, my God, we got to get up to 90 or something. Can we get about 58 that way? I hope. Yeah, what's your question? The terminology applies to the absolute value. The words. The words. All right. Oh, we got up to 63. All right. Three seconds. One, two, three. All right, there we go. Inferior goods, when the income goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. Income elasticity is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in income. And so if they're going in opposite directions, you're either going to have quantity demanded is less than zero when the change in income is greater than zero. That's a negative number, right? Or quantity demanded change is going to be positive when income goes down. That's a negative number. So what do we get? Which of these two examples, top or bottom? Which of those is an inferior good? The top one or the bottom one? The bottom one. The bottom one's an example of an inferior good because when the, which way did it go? When the income went up, quantity demanded went down. All that mattered was the sign. What makes it inferior or normal is the sign and not the size. And so, whoa, da, 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 da. there we go. Inferior goods have income elasticity less than zero. It could be between zero and one, and negative one. It could be bigger than negative one, but in any case, it's a negative number. So it could be relatively inelastic. It could be relatively elastic, but they go in the opposite direction. All right, let's look at price elasticity of demand. Let's see how we do on that one. For price elasticity of demand, remember that the demand curve always slopes down, so we don't have this whole sign problem going on. It's always the case that an increase in price gives us a decrease in quantity demanded, and a decrease in price gives us an increase in quantity demanded. So that price elasticity of demand is always going to be what? Positive or negative? Negative, because these things are moving in the opposite direction. So if the price, if the percentage change in price is positive, the percentage change in quantity demand is going to be negative, and vice versa. So it's always going to have a negative value. Oh, I have no idea why that's there. Let's just get rid of it. There we go. That, go away. No, no. I thought I clicked close. Ah! Okay, in a minute it will go away, won't it? Maybe. There. Oh, wait, there. It went away. Cool. Okay, let's hope nothing else happens. Uh, the price elasticity of demand is telling us by how much quantity demand it changes when the price changes. The answer to that question is the price elasticity of demand. Let's do some examples. 